And then we talked about, for our nation, the vision that somebody had where the angel came down, walked right into the joint houses of Congress, stepped up to the podium, unrolled a scroll, and announced, America shall be saved. Come on, how many know that America needs to be saved? It needs to be saved from herself. It needs to be saved from wickedness. But how many believe that righteousness exalts a nation and that God still has a plan for the United States of America? Amen? I believe we've got to get in alignment with what God has said. Listen, all this was said and then the crisis hit. Physical crisis, economic crisis. It was a, a political crisis. We're now in a political crisis with a contentious um, undecided election no matter how much they tell you it's decided it's not decided there's a lot of contending that's still going on but let me just say this here's what we have to know as people of God and here's what we've got to know as prophetic people is that we need to know this go go to the next slide we need to know this don't doubt in the dark what you heard in the light in other words, when everything was going wonderful, God spoke, God gave us promises, and then it got dark. Come on, guys, don't doubt in the dark what we heard in the light. Let's stay in alignment. Let's stay in agreement. Come on, you don't even have to figure out how God's going to do it. Matter of fact, I, I have this little non-biblical idea that if we figure out how God's going to do it, he'll do it a different way. <laughs> just to say, you're not going to figure me out. Come on, guys, think about this. God said to David, you're going to be king, right? Shepherd boy, lowest in his family, eighth son in his family. Next thing that we know, he goes out, he kills Goliath. He marries the king's daughter. He moves into the palace. Do you think David's going, oh, now I understand how this prophecy is going to come to pass. How many know that's not how it came to pass? How many know that he went through years and years of hiding out in caves, fighting the Philistines, being tracked down by Saul, Saul trying to kill him? Come on. <laughs> Sometimes we think we've got it all figured out. God's saying, just, just, you're going to have to keep your eyes on me and trust and believe the promise and not let go of it. Don't doubt in the dark what you heard in the light. Now, I, I thought, you know, if the enemy wanted to come in, and I think that a, a big part of this is not really not just about America. It's about what's happening globally. But the same effect has happened globally is that churches were disassembled. Okay? Now, if I was the devil, and I'm not, just to clarify, <laughs> okay, I would try to figure out a way to make sure corporate gatherings did not happen. Right? Because the enemy is in the process of trying to orchestrate a global takedown, an antichrist agenda. And the first thing he had to do is get the church out of the way, the praying church out of the way. So he disassembled the church, except the church didn't disassemble. We jumped on the internet. We figured out how to connect. We started doing communion every day. All over the place. Let me tell you, some of you have been to church more this year from the internet than you've been to in your life. Doesn't mean come back, don't come back to church. I'm talking to you, Vision Nation. Go back to church, okay? But I'm just, I'm just saying that we, ha we engaged because we could see what the enemy was trying to do. And I'm telling you, this is the tipping point we're in. Let's look at this scripture. Hosea chapter 2. As I prayed about this morning, I wanted to just, just give you this scripture. Hosea chapter 2. This was God's promise of mercy and faithfulness even to unfaithful Israel. Some people say, how can God bless America? The same way that God spoke this over his people back in, back in this time where God is actually resetting his church, resetting his bride, the same way that Hosea's bride was being reset. And it lists all the stuff of, of her unfaithfulness, but then it says this. This is how God positioned himself towards his bride and how he's positioned himself towards us, and I believe it, even towards this nation that I believe he loves. It says this. It says, therefore, the Lord says, I will allure her. This is the intimacy of our father. 
Therefore, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness. How many feel like you've been in the wilderness this year? I will bring her into the wilderness and I will speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there. From where? The wilderness. God's saying, I'm going to give you vineyards out of your wilderness. I'm going to cause your desert to blossom and bloom like a rose. But this is the part that I wanted to get to. It says, I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. The valley of Achor. The word Achor means the valley of trouble. How many feel like you've been walking through the valley this year? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Amen? I am with you. I am with you. I am for you. I am for you. Come on. I will turn your valley of trouble into a door of hope. Come on, how many can just receive that promise today? It's a promise from God. It says, no matter what you face, if it's COVID-19, if it's economic troubles, I believe it's a word for our nation. Whatever it is that we face, God's saying, I'm telling you, I want to change your valley of trouble into a door of hope. I want to turn the curse to a blessing for you because I love you. Deuteronomy 23, verse 5. And so this is how we're going to work with God in the tipping point. I'm just going to give you four quick points, okay? Because... Before I get to the point, so I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you some scriptures. Because listen, just because God gives us a promise doesn't mean it automatically comes to pass. That may be shocking to some of you. <laughs> Look at this. Psalm 78, 9. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. That's a terrifying scripture. They were fully armed, fully equipped, called to go to battle. I think that there's a battle going on for this nation. And if you're not engaging, then this is your scripture. <laughs> Don't turn back. You're armed. You're ready for battle. I'm talking to my friends out in the Vision Nation world as well. We're armed. We're ready for the battle. Don't turn back. Don't you dare quit. Come on, we got to fight this thing through. Isaiah 28, verse 5 and 6 declares, In that day, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the angel armies, Jehovah Sabaoth, the God of war, that's what Lord of hosts means, will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, for a spirit of justice to him who sits in just judgment. Can we believe that God's going to release on this nation a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and on the church for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gates? Let's get in alignment with God's word. 1 Timothy 1.18 tells us war a good warfare with the prophecies that have gone on before you. Come on, a lot of people are saying, oh, the prophetic words didn't come to pass. The, prophetic, the prophets missed it. The prophets this, the prophets that. Have they never heard of this scripture? Have they never understood the concept that God may speak in one moment and then all hell breaks loose in the next moment? Let me tell you, when all hell breaks loose against God's church, God breaks loose against all hell. And we got to start understanding that when we stand for God, God will rise up and fight for us. Amen? And, but we've got to wage a warfare. We've got to war a warfare by the things that God has said. So let me ask you this. What has God said? What has he said to you individually? What has God said to us corporately? What is God saying to this nation? And how do we work with him? Number one, we're going to get under that car. We're going to flip it. We're going to lift through prayer and through worship. Come on, guys. Worship doesn't just, isn't just there to make us feel good. I I, this, this scripture isn't up there. But, um, but let me encourage you that um, 
I'm, I'm going to give you some scriptures because I forgot to put them up on the screen, apparently. Um, <laughs> it actually says in Revelations 5, 8 that there's bowls in heaven. I want you to get this with a tipping point. There's bowls in heaven which are filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Revelations 5, 8. When those bowls get full, what does it say happens? There's a tipping point, right? It gets poured out. So our job as the church is to fill the bowls. How do we fill the bowls? We fill it through prayer. We fill it through worship. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Okay, let me give it to you in the Amplified. It says, The earnest, heartfelt, continuous prayer of a righteous man. Doesn't sound like wimpy prayers, does it? The earnest, heartfelt, continuous prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. It is dynamic in its working. When we pray, things happen. Come on, Mickey was dying. Is that true, Nikki? Mickey? And Evelyn went in there. She prayed. She prophesied. She anointed the room. She did spiritual warfare. She probably stood on her head in the process. She made a decision. I'm not going to let him go. Come on. Listen to what George Patton said. He was a general in the Second World War. For those of you that haven't heard of him, I had to look for a George Patton quote that was clean enough to quote in church, okay? This is a good one, though, <laughs> right? He says, those who pray do more for this world than those who fight. And when the battle goes from bad to worse, it's because there are more battles than there are prayers. 